we respond to a domestic uh, assault and and the man has has punched his wife and she's sitting there with a broken nose and bloods on the floor um, I, have, I have a visceral angry response to that man and so it makes it very difficult for me to connect with him even though he might have addiction issues even though he might be mentally ill I'm still pissed off that he did that to her as a paramedic we encounter all walks of society all all day every day whether it be you know in a car accident on the side of the road substance abuse or cardiac arrest you know we we see the whole broad spectrum of patients i always say that we deal with 10 percent of the population 90 percent of the time and they're at their lowest and it's like that for ehs and i'm sure that's it's like that for er staff as well when you get that all the time it just drains you. It, it really just, it tears you down because you're seeing the constant negative. Unless you have a little bit of a wider lens about the various conditions and circumstances of people's lives, it can be quite easy to be frustrated with seeing people who come over and over again for health care or for social care. And I got in trouble and I went to Ocala, and in Ocala is where I did my first heroin and uh, got out with a habit. And um, I guess I was 20 and just kind of went from there, you know, started selling drugs and in and out of prison and stuff like that. I had just gotten out of jail and um, I had nowhere to go, of course, when I got out. So, of course, I went to where I knew, and that was Maine and Hastings. Um, I spent seven days um, partying, getting high, making money, doing what I did down there. And after seven days, you're not really coherent. <laughs> As a new recruit um, working uh, on the streets uh, in uniform, I found that um, it was a me against them mentality, that there was nothing good that could come from any of these drug users that there was nothing positive and that there was nothing that I could do except for arrest them and put them in jail for whatever kind of disobedience they had caused. The missing piece in medical education and the education of psychologists, first responders, police personnel, is who these people actually are and how they got to use their substances. In other words, we tend to see them from the perspective of the behaviors which are often antisocial, illegal, and certainly self harming. What we don't see is how people get to that stage of life. The root causes of substance use are intricately and irrefutably linked to people's adverse childhood experiences, to people's histories of trauma, to the various forms of violence that people experience in their everyday lives, including the violence of being discriminated against for some people. In this country, I think we've confused the issue of drug using or alcoholism with criminality. We had nicknames for the officers down there. Like there were uh, Mutt and Jeff, there's Salt and Pepper, um, uh, L Laurel and Heidi. All you ever saw the police doing was walking up and down the street arresting people. It was definitely, it was definitely an us versus them mentality, and it still is, um, to my knowledge. One of the most serious diseases police officers can uh, be inflicted with is the disease, disease of cynicism. Uh, it's a, a horrible disease to watch, and it can spread. Uh, it's very catchy, uh, and it's very understandable. You, you know, compassion is, is always there. It's what happens when you come in and how, how can I help you? And you get a, you get an F-bomb or you get a, you know, get on my face or, okay, well, hang on. I just want to, I'm not going to hurt you. I, you know, I want to talk and, and, um, and you get that resistant. It's hard to keep it. So when you're walking into the room and you might have a uniform on, I see you as representing authority and representing a larger system that's not necessarily been a friend to my people or to me. So I might be suspicious and I might have good reasons to be suspicious and maybe that's one of the ways I take care of my family and myself is not to trust you. We do have to practice from a stance of realizing that many Aboriginal people 
do have some distrust of the healthcare system because of past practices and because of their own or their family's experience in the healthcare system. When I'm seeing an Indigenous person, then I think it's important that people have a pretty good context for seeing that behaviour, so that we're not stereotyping that person and um, attaching all kinds of negative beliefs or assumptions in a, and that they are going to affect the way that I'm interacting with that person. That really is the heart of the issue here. We think those judgments, even when we try and hide them, are either appropriate or irrelevant, but they're not. These people have been hurt over and over and over again, and they've been hurt mostly for not being accepted for who they are. When they pick up on our judgments and our irritation and our impatience, and really our own despair at not knowing how to deal with them, they take that personally, and it's a further traumatization. The problem is we only exercise the kindness to a stranger when they fit a certain model or image we have of individuals who deserve that. I guess it's, I started using drugs when I was 11. My mom was an alcoholic, so she wasn't around much. And um, I experimented with pills. And uh, I just, uh, right off the bat, it, it filled a hole that it was something was missing in my life, right? I just, I, I never had a father, so I always felt different when I was in school until I got into junior high school and stuff like that, and I found somewhere where I belonged, right? And that was with the kids that were breaking the law and being the rebel without a cause and stuff like that. The drugs take you away from the ones you love, um, any kind of caring or concern or, or showing any, because you don't have to down there. You can just be lost, and it's, it's like a... It's like a vortex, it sucks you in there and keeps you there. When we're looking at somebody with a serious substance use problem, that is a hurting person. That is someone who's been through a lot of trauma and we can't judge them because we didn't grow up in their shoes. We have a responsibility to learn about what their stories actually are, what their narratives are, what their personal histories are. And if that doesn't change how we act, then, then we need to really think about that. It really is the seemingly small uh, gestures, glances, tones of voice, facial expressions that make the world of difference to people feeling like you're conveying some degree of care, no matter what condition that they're in, that it can be uh, an act of, of health and healing to actually treat someone with even a small gesture of respect, regardless of what your own judgments are about that person. And when you're dealing with addictions, you need to be very patient and have a good listening ear. Sometimes in the ER, you don't have that time, right? But you want to make the time. You always have to keep in mind that uh, when the patient comes in, or a client comes in, that uh, they need help. And sometimes how we, how we approach that um, is very important. As somebody who's intoxicated or overdosed, or is experiencing some kind of crisis as a result of substance use is no different than someone having a heart attack or you know having a diabetic episode. You would want to give them kind, encouraging, and respectful words to let them know that you're, near, that you're there to help them, that you're responding to what's going on for them. It should be the same as people with substance use issues. My name is Crystal, I'm the nurse on today. I've come to understand that and believe that a person who is truly addicted to drugs can't just stop, that they're not able to, that, that the vast majority of people without help cannot deal with their addiction. I had an addiction to heroin for some time and uh, I'd come to a place uh, where it was getting harder and harder to provide myself with the drugs I needed to not be sick for that day. That time of my life is a place of hopelessness. I just made a decision that I just wanted to die, right? And I went in the bush there and, and uh, injected some heroin. And a man needing to relieve himself went off the walking path of Holland Park and happened to see me laying in the bush and thought I was dead. When he 
came upon a couple of police officers. Um, he said, I found somebody dead in the bush and he, the police officers went with him. He showed them where I was and, and Colleen happened to be in the back of the police car um, doing their rounds. She's a mental health nurse. Well, she stayed in the car while they went in the bush and she heard them say like, if EHS doesn't get here soon, this guy's gonna die, right? And that, at that time she got out of the police vehicle and decided to go into the bush and find where I was laying. And so she did what nurses do, right? Just tried all the different pressure points and none of that worked. And then she said, finally she used her elbow in my sternum and I took a deep breath and that's when she figured there may be a chance, right? Next thing I know, I was waking up 10 days later in Cern Memorial Hospital. My brother-in-law read the letter to me and just explained where I was found and how I was found. And These events mean something, David Radcliffe. Where there is life, there is hope. You have been granted the miracle of a true second chance at life. My suggestion to you is that you embrace the moment and seek recovery. While I was in a coma, she, she and a couple of the police officers came there. I just really realized at that time how much people care, you know what I mean? That gift of connecting to people, of showing empathy, of trying to understand their needs, uh, is critical to being a police officer, to getting people through those stories. Now, if they have two or three encounters like that, where that genuine, um, you know, messaging is being given, they may start to say to themselves, you know, I'm worth something here. Somebody else believes in me. Being relational means not taking it personally. You know, I come there, Johnny Good Intentions, and somebody's, you know, being really abusive to me. I mean, I've got to dig deep and, and touch that humanity and remember, oh, yes, that's right. Not only am I professional, but there's a context for this behavior. I'm a good, I'm a caring person, and I can help this person. They were going to arrest me for um, public nuisance because I was being a public nuisance. <laughs> and um, they were putting me in the back seat of the cop car. Well, I wasn't going. <laughs> I didn't want to go. They couldn't make me go. So I kicked the window and smashed the backseat window out of the cop car. I had half severed my Achilles tendon from kicking out the window. They took me to the hospital in the cop car. They didn't call an ambulance. They told me that I would have to have, to have surgery, that I have to stay in the hospital. Well, I didn't want to stay in the hospital. And they needed to bandage it up so that it, until I went into surgery, I was seven days up. They couldn't give me any painkiller or anything because they didn't know what I was on. They like I, they could OD me, right? And of course, I was feeling every inch of it and screaming and flipping out and just being really, really, really loud in the hospital. They brought in security guards to hold me down because I, by then I was like irate and and being angry and not wanting to stay and wanting to leave. A nurse came in and said, stopped everybody and told them all to just stop what you're doing. Leave her alone, let me talk to her. And she came over and, and just paid attention to me and told me step by step exactly what they were gonna do and that they weren't torturing me and that <laughs> I didn't have to stay and it, it was just, she, she wanted to help me. <laughs> she wanted me to stay and get it taken care of. And she didn't want me to uh, disrupt the whole hospital. <laughs> and oh, that's all it took. I got into an incident uh, in an alley uh, behind Pigeon Park downtown with a guy. And it was over something stupid. T -t Today, I can't remember what it was over. Um, after arguing with this fellow for a few minutes, I turned to walk away and he stabbed me in the back. Um, and it pierced my lung. These two police officers come around the corner and everyone around me took off and left me there. And these two police came in and, and treated me amazing. They were just instantly, they saw a threat and they were very professional. They were on their um, radios right away. Everything was, sir, 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 not, hey, you. Sir, can you hear me? Are you okay? What happened? Did you see anything? Da, da, da. Um, and I wasn't being very cooperative or nice. I mean, with my resentments and what was going on at the time. And I was wincing in pain. And um, I've seen other incidences where people are wincing in pain. The guy's like, you know, calm down, calm down, settle down. There was none of that. It was, they let me scream. They let me hurt. Um, I got the paramedic there as soon as possible. They stayed with me the whole time. In an instant, it changed my total opinion. Um, it bridged that gap for me. 
I think that these brief moments of conveying acceptance and a non-judgmental stance can be brief and fleeting, but the impact can be very profound and significant for the person. I had a few big revelations uh, while working in uniform, and I eventually learned that they didn't choose this lifestyle, they were trapped in this lifestyle, and that they needed help, they needed some guidance or assistance or referral or partnership to help get through this. Mindfulness allows us to view somebody without judgment, just observe what's going on. And it allows us to observe our own reaction to that person and how that may affect our interaction with that person. So if I find my buttons getting pushed, I'm mindful that I'm experiencing countertransference, that I'm experiencing judgmentalness, and I can take a step back from myself and, and put on that sort of, that more, that bigger overview. I'm human, she's human, she has needs, she's not able to express her needs well, I'm the professional, it's up to me to figure out what her needs are. To ask for help is one of the hardest things for any human to do. Hard for me to do, hard for you to do. Uh, a person who's addicted to drugs or, or struggling with mental illness feels shame, remorse, guilt, and so it's even harder for them to ask for help. Anybody who's in that situation is just exquisitely sensitized to anything that might imply uh, blame, rejection, marginalization, depersonalization. So we tend to look upon only their behaviors and often judge them for the behaviors. And that judgment often shows up in our demeanor, in our facial expression, in our tone of voice, in how we speak to them, in how we even think about them. It's not just a theoretical or psychological question. We're actually talking about brain physiology here and, and, and the physiology of the nervous system. We can evoke a positive, receptive physiological state, or we can evoke just as easily or more easily, perhaps, a defensive hostile. It's a very pressured environment, and um, really the spotlight has to be shone on, on us. Uh, and we have to be a little bit more self-conscious, I think, about how it is that we speak to people and the phrases we use and the tone of voice. It actually doesn't take any more time to convey acceptance and warmth to a person as it does to convey judgment. I do think that conveying uh, respect and acceptance of a person, no matter what their circumstances are, is a health-promoting act in and of itself. It's all in how you approach the situation. As long as you approach the situation with the want and desire to care, the situation is gonna go well and we can actually make a difference. It's when you don't approach it with uh, that little bit of compassion, that, that little bit of this is a person, that things go bad and we can't help anybody. As the word implies, being in tune with, being on the same wavelength with, and there's any number of ways of being attuned. We can be attuned intellectually by, by seeing or perceiving things the same way, understanding something the same way. We're intellectually attuned. Emotional attunement means something different or something deeper. It means that I understand the emotional state that you are in. I get it and I can share it with you and I can communicate to you that I share it. The more we can attune with them now, the more that creates that sense of safety, which then brings them, to that, brings them into that social engagement mode, that whole set of nervous system reactions that allow them to receive our care and induce them to cooperate with us. When somebody treats me with respect and compassion, you really can tell the sincerity in somebody. Uh, you know phony when you see one, especially from the places I've walked. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if the first responders remember that um, they're, they're people too, 
and they have feelings and emotions, even though at the moment they don't seem to. They do. They try to hide it to the best of their ability, that uh, you can't hurt me attitude, and that nothing you say is going to do anything. But believe me, everything that you say and do to them has an impact. But to remember that if you don't warm up to me right away, that there is a whole history of relations that is behind that distrust. And it's my job to accept that and to hold that and to earn your trust. And again, I can do that in very quick, fleeting moments. It is in the gestures, the glances, the tone of voice, and the words that I use with you. It doesn't take extra time. I think we can earn people's trust in seemingly small ways. And I really do try to cultivate that. Change is a complex process, and it's not a linear process. As we know, it's a circular process that often goes back to relapse. But maybe six months down the road, two years down the road, 10 years down the road, all of a sudden they remember 10 years back and they go, I remember that cop. I remember that guy. He actually took more than his 30 seconds that he really probably would have normally, and he actually made a difference. He said something that struck a chord that stuck with them that 10 years down the road is still repeats in his brain. It's funny, the last time I went to jail, the judge said to me, he said, Mr. Ratcliffe, if you stop breaking the law, you're gonna stop going to jail, you know what I mean? And I know that sounds really, really simple, but I just never heard it like I heard it that time. And I just remember going back to my cell and he was really nice to me, but at the end of his niceness, he said, I, I still have to sentence you to prison, you know what I mean? And I was just like, that time it wasn't, oh man, you know what I mean? It was like, well, you know, maybe I should do something different this time. At every level we can have is if we can have positive interactions, not only are we making it more likely that that person will get treatment and, and go down the, the route of recovery, but the person hopefully who's providing that positive care will also get a sense of satisfaction. And I think what may prevent that is the thought that it really doesn't matter. And I think from my perspective, we see enough people getting better that we think it does matter. This is where you have to trust. You just have to trust that if you do your job the best way you can, and if you're as clear and attuned with yourself as you can be, and if you're as humane and compassionate and provide that sense of safety to the other that you're helping, that you're adding to something that's gonna be of positive impact to their lives, whether or not you see the, the effects of that. I ended up staying on the methadone program for um, the whole eight months that I was um, in the cast. It helped me stay off the street. It helped me get better. <laughs> I don't think many people, my guess is first responders, often appreciate how sometimes what may seem as insignificant or trivial or very small can make a profound difference in someone's life. And I'm talking about things like the tone of voice, uh, eye contact. The one thing I remember about the ambulance ride is that she was holding my hand and she was right in my face and, and talking to me and stay with us and are you, you're okay, you're going to hospital. I distinctly remember her looking me right in my eyes and, and keeping eye contact the whole way and, and uh, smiling. This lady, there was no wall. There, there was just compassion, caring, help. This is my job, I save people. This is what I do, you know. Um, and looking back on it now, I felt really stupid from the judgment I had because I basically labeled every cop and every paramedic and every person as the man and screw them and they don't care about us. And um, looking back on this and seeing how three random strangers just totally came in and, and showed me I was wrong was, was pretty big. And people will often tell you that, that they'll still remember one doctor or one nurse or one policeman, or one, or one emergency personnel, whoever it was, who actually spoke to them humanely. And all the more they remember that, because it's very rare in their lives to get that. It wasn't what their experience was to begin with, and it hasn't been their experience ever since. It's just bizarre because I always viewed them as the enemy, right? You know, and when I really look at it now, that I'm older, my perceptions changed a bit. Uh, 
they have been really the only constant in my life that's showed any kind of care, right? You know what I mean? That, that's never, never varied in any way, right? It's always been the same. The benefit we all get is that uh, if people are marginalized and further and further from relationships, because I think it's relationships that are going to carry them out of there, if they're alienated from those helping relationships, that uh, connection to substances is going to spiral downward and downward and downward. And uh, when we can open any kind of door to an alternative pathway, uh, we're doing something good. When someone is able to regain their sense of value and their identity, and they're able to bring what they have to the world, that obviously has huge effects on, on their immediate family, place of work, friends, colleagues, and the community. Everybody is somebody's son or daughter, or mother, or wife, or, uh, you know, grandmother. There's opportunities for first responders sometimes to ask questions that help remind people of who they are and help remind people of what matters. I was pulling a night shift and, uh, you know, I, I used to remember the patient. I got triaged and said, Don, there's somebody here uh, to see you. And so I said, okay. And Someone had put him in the interview room too, and um, I, I came in and I, I introduced myself and I said, um, you know, what can I do to, to, to help you uh, for today? He was down and out. Um, all his sponsors kind of just, he felt that he was, the doors were closing in on him. And uh, we just kept on talking and, you know, we got more into personal history of, of the re just being real. I think about 18 months later, um, yeah, he, um, he came back and uh, presented to the ER. That was a busy day. I still uh, remember it very clearly. I uh, went out and, and uh, yeah, just as I came around the corner, I recognized him. You know, he just came to tell me that he was 18 months clean. Yeah. Today, I live in a beautiful home. I have my son in the basement suite, so he's nice and close. Um, my daughter's just got married and has a little boy, so <clears throat> they're doing awesome. And um, just to be, a, it took a while uh, to be a part of their lives. They were always afraid that I would uh, come back and leave and come back and leave. And yes, that happened in the beginning of my recovery. Um, I relapsed quite a few times. Um, but now that I've gotten a little bit of sobriety under my belt, um, I, w I wouldn't give it up for anything, nothing. Nothing would uh, send me back to me in Hastings. She made me realize, like my beliefs in God and all that stuff. I never really realized that. Uh, I always believed in something. I just didn't think it believed in me. And um, believing that I have hope, you know, I can. There's something at the end of all this. And uh, it's just manifested in so many different ways as a direct result of her taking the time. You know, you just uh, always. I always say, you know, I, I leave my door open for people to come and talk to me or whatever. And, you know, I was ready to push that up aside and because it was such a busy day and use that as an excuse not to go see somebody who just wanted to acknowledge the help that I gave them. So that was powerful. Now there is constant eye contact. Now there is, hey, sir, how are you doing today? There's, you know, um, there's respect. There's, there's a life. My family lets me in their house. They answer my calls. They call me. Who'd have thought? Um, I actually have more than one friend on Facebook. So it's a very natural human, human process, but the more we take responsibility for it as caregivers, the more we can actually fulfill what we came into this business to do, which is to help people and to help society. So if you can interrupt their expectation by treating them kindly, that may open a window into change for them. So this is the detox for the Cyber Home Management. We have a medical staff as well as a counselor there to help you with any sort of referrals or information you might need. This is going to be your place, so you can do it forever. And this is it. Welcome home. Alright. Thank you.
people have value. And even if they're broken, that, that doesn't mean that they're, they're not worth anything. We're all a little broken. There are a lot of opportunities for all of us to participate in change. As first responders, as police, as people working in um, emergency situations, you have an opportunity every single day to change this relationship. It's, it comes up in the way that you talk to me, whether you're looking at me as a person or you're seeing me as some pathologized uh, uh, stereotype. So, I mean, you have a chance to change this. I'm a person and I have feelings too. Even though I'm out of it and, and I'm wasted and I'm being a brat right now, I'm still a person and I still feel and I'm, f I'm afraid. I'm afraid of what you guys are doing to me. All you need to do is explain it to me and show me a little bit of respect. I'll give it back. If this kind of awareness of the neurophysiology of trauma, of the neurophysiology of response, receptivity, or defensiveness, and the awareness of who we are in a particular process or interaction has a decisive impact on the outcome of that interaction. If, the, if all these awarenesses were systemically embedded in our workplaces and in our institutions of training, and if interaction after interaction, this is what they experienced, well then we know that that, that cumulative effect would eventually shift their perspective. And each little interaction contributed to that shift. I, and I, people always say, oh, you, you know, oh, you save lives every day. It's like, no, I don't. I make a difference in somebody's life every day. And that's, that's, that's what gives me the willingness to go on. I made a difference and it's, that's, that's as much as it needs to take. That's all it takes for me. Never give up. Never give up on the person. The person is never too far gone until they're dead. Your 